Being a police officer, I have seen and heard a multitude of hot takes as it relates to law enforcement. Usually, they focus on my integrity and my supposed inability to uphold the Constitution due to my selected career path. But something that recently caught my eye was a video made by Gunmetal here on YouTube titled, Is Ready or Not Copaganda? Ultimately, Gunmetal states that Ready or Not is not explicitly copaganda, but that the game's depiction of police officers is a complete fantasy. And he goes on to make some larger, what I believe to be, faulty conclusions about police as a whole and the mad narrative of law enforcement written into Ready or Not. I can hear what you're saying now. 60, we come to you for video games, tactics, and the memes, not for politics. And while I know a larger percentage of you feel that way, I also know that some of you enjoy a good video essay from time to time, just as I do. That being said, this video will get political. If you're not interested in that, I sincerely do not blame you. In that case, feel free to watch some of my other content instead. With all that being said, let's get into the video. My first and main point of contention for the video starts off when Gunmetal states that essentially Ready or Not is just a fantasy and not a reflection of reality. The fantasy is a fantasy because even if a real life SWAT team lives up to it, the officers are upstanding, professional, and used appropriately in situations of dire need, the ultimate system they support, the justice system, is fundamentally broken. Even the best cops who save lives, hate racists, and want a better, more functional justice system cannot pursue these goals while executing its current vision. As far as the justice system being broken in some ways, I can attest that in some cases, he's absolutely right. In the US, there are some times that people we arrest end up getting out on bail that really shouldn't, and eventually end up back in jail a week later for doing the exact same thing that got them there in the first place, and ultimately, they become habitual recidivists. I take issue with the false dilemma that Gunmetal is creating though. His argument seems to be that basically it doesn't matter what you do as a police officer because you by being a police officer substantiates that you are the proximate cause of suffering to people within the justice system. To me, that doesn't track, not even by a long shot. Essentially, it doesn't matter how many OD calls I go to where I Narcan the heroin addict thus saving their life, nor however many shots fired calls I go to not knowing if I'm going home to my wife because someone wants to ambush a police officer. All of it, by this standard, is in vain. What I think Gunmetal is focusing on in his video is the war on drugs, a plethora of policies and legislation put in place to attempt to reduce drug usage by increasing prison sentences for drug users, manufacturers, and dealers. And to Gunmetal's credit, I don't disagree. A good portion of these policies had dire effects on the nation and did nothing to truly stop the influx of drug usage overall. However, I take issue that he conflates these broken policies and legislation with all other acts done by police officers, especially actions that are devoid of drug interdiction. In my opinion, this leads to a faulty generalization that it essentially doesn't matter what the individual officer does. They are still supporting a quote unquote broken system and by that standard cannot police ethically. There is nothing they can do to change that. From what I can see, Gunmetal fails to realize that while the justice system may have a vision, Individual officers do not always align themselves with that vision. Police One and LSU conducted a survey of over 3,500 officers on the concept of decriminalizing marijuana. Over 60% of those respondents believe incarceration is an ineffective method of reducing marijuana usage in society. In that same survey, 31% of respondents believe marijuana should be decriminalized and another 16 said maybe. Now, to be fair, this is a small sample size, but it's fairly indicative that we as officers are not one giant hive mind. We don't just inherently share the vision of the justice system because it's what's established. To me, arguments in this vein are incredibly telling of people who have not worked the job before. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying you need to have been a police officer to have an opinion on the matter, but it tends to be the people who have never worked the job before that miss the largest component of policing. That component is discretion. Discretion is skipped over in this discussion more times than I can even believe. For those of you who don't know, discretion in the law enforcement sense is an individual officer's ability to decide what to do in a given situation, as far as enforcement or non-enforcement activity. For instance, I've been in many situations where I've pulled someone over, had probable cause to search their vehicle, found an ounce of weed, and just told them to stomp it out. Other times I find a glass pipe with marijuana residue and instead of littering the roadway with glass, I seize the pipe and give them a class C citation instead of taking them to jail. I am incredibly cognizant that the lives of the people I interact with will be drastically swayed by the enforcement actions I take. That's why I don't take every 18 year old to jail for possession of THC vapes. In the state of Texas, that lands them a felony. And all for what? 
purchasing a vape they thought was just CBD at the gas station where it's readily sold behind the counter? But see, that's my choice to not enforce that, and instead have them just break the vape in half or give them a possession of drug paraphernalia ticket instead. That's my discretion. Discretion that every officer is entrusted to use to the best of their judgment. Discretion that is used way more often than most people will ever know. And in before everyone comments, but 60, that's just you, you're one officer, not every officer thinks like that. And you're right, but having gone to a mixed department academy, I know for a fact that discretion is taught at least through the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement and that officer outlooks on an anecdotal level about smaller drug crimes are fairly forgiving. As to these previous points, Gunmetal substantiates his claims by stating, There is no ethical policing because the entire justice system is built not to deliver justice nor enforce laws, but to protect the wealthy and powerful when inflict further misery on the poor. I find this explanation incredibly wanting. Because you believe the justice system to be setting its priorities based on what the wealthy want, that means individual officers cannot then ethically police? That makes no sense. I also find it incredibly galling they believe that the justice system, even on a local level, cannot maintain its function to deliver justice, nor to enforce the laws that are set in place by the states or even those localities. What evidence do you have to support this? Or are you once again making a gross generalization about the quote unquote justice system overall? I also don't remember the last time I encountered a wealthy guy beating his wife up and thought to myself, well, gee, he's wealthy so I better not arrest him. To be clear, I'm being a bit tongue-in-cheek, and I understand his point that wealthier people can afford better legal protection, allowing them to have better odds of getting out of a conviction. But that does not then confer blame upon the officer that made the arrest to be somehow ethically compromised. That's like blaming the triage nurse for killing a patient that is now on the fifth floor of the hospital where the floor nurse there administered the wrong medication. Well, the triage nurse allowed the patient into the hospital. He or she should have known that one of the nurses in the hospital might make a mistake. Therefore, it was unethical to admit them into the hospital system. See how that doesn't track? Granted, I get the comparison itself is a bit unbalanced as we as officers are placing people into the justice system and not admitting them, but the outcome of that hypothetical is incredibly similar to the one that Gunmetal is portraying. The Justice Department has been totally decoupled from any meaningful regulation or accountability, which has gutted the purpose those institutions have traditionally held when it comes to their roles in organizing and safeguarding society. Bit by bit, inch by inch, each of these institutions have fallen prey to regulatory capture. If you mean to say the justice system as in the federal DOJ, then I can see the point you're making. The FBI and ATF have far overextended their provisions as law enforcement agencies and have seen their way to act as legislative bodies with unchecked power. To that, I don't disagree. I think the federal government's purpose is solely to protect life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for all people and to defend the nation. The problem thus arises again where I am worried you are making broad strokes about law enforcement agencies across the nation and that we somehow act in lockstep with the federal government. We don't, obviously. We may sometimes work with the FBI or the ATF, but that does not mean we are then a subset of those agencies. With their unparalleled ability to accrue, concentrate, and thereby direct the flow of wealth, corporations and the oligarchs that run them have fundamentally subverted every facet of a functional society. The only purpose these systems fulfill anymore is to further the acquisition of yet more capital. This isn't some crazy Marxist take from a frothing infantile tanky. This is reality. So basically, you are saying that corporations are the ones that are running the justice system. Well then, which corporations? Which oligarchs? How have they subverted these systems? How do they put pressure on law enforcement agencies to enforce them to become just as corrupt and enforce the laws they want? And at what level? What again about local justice systems? Personally, I'm not a huge fan of BlackRock either, but I don't remember the last time they paid me to start making arrests for minor drug possession. This sounds like a copypasta on the R Gen Z Dong subreddit. At no point did I hear any basis for these claims, thus I won't be providing an hour-long lecture of the basis of America's justice system and the pivotal role that Judeo-Christian moral structures had on its formation of most laws that currently exist, and not some monolithic The Man, Koch Brothers, or Malate Stage Capitalism. Then what is the reality of the police? Again, they're essentially foot soldiers for the wealthy, serving as facilitators for the prison industrial complex, suppressors of labor movements, and the persecutors of marginalized communities. More broadly, in their pursuit of protecting oligarchs, they are the instrument of violence directed at all poor people, not just minorities. Laws are written by lobbyists to target the impoverished, the impoverished are persecuted, and then the impoverished are enslaved. 
Again, I don't remember the last time I was told by a wealthy dude to arrest people for minor drug offenses. There is no personal benefit to me arresting people for the sole purpose of possessing something like marijuana alone. Personally, I'd like to identify how many times people have been arrested for marijuana possession alone and compare that with how many times people were arrested for the possession of unprescribed medications or harder drugs in conjunction with possession of marijuana. That latter number, I would estimate, would be pretty high. And suppressor of labor movements? What is this, 1912? I don't disagree that police en masse have been used as political pawns to act in fascistic fashion for things like the labor movement and the civil rights movement back then, but currently, as of 2023, this narrative just doesn't track. Again, you are rehashing what you said earlier. Are you saying that poor people are just mercilessly beaten and targeted by police officers because they're poor? Because that's a pretty bold take. If I'm to take you at what I think you really mean in that people in impoverished communities have a higher likelihood to be victimized and or be victimizers, then on that, I agree with you. But then if that's the case, interactions with police officers will go up because that's what happens. When crimes occur, people call the police. The United States Department of Justice has a paper on this demonstrating exactly this phenomena. The lower the income, the higher the rate of violent victimization. Victimization means crime. Crime means people call the police. Police means police interaction. Interaction means possible requirement of use of force by the officer. I don't get what about that is not a direct outcome of cause and effect. By the way, you have not mentioned what criminal laws specifically were created to directly target the poor community. Even then, to say that a specific crime being enforced would only then affect those communities would be absurd, as the law is the law. If murder is illegal, it's illegal for everyone. Again, the justice system isn't perfect in convicting those that need it, such as wealthy celebrities, but officers in that system do their best to effect arrests for those who break said laws. What happens after the arrest is out of their hands. Gunmetal goes further to talk about the war on drugs, to which again, I have already stated my agreement with its inefficacy. But because that policy was ineffective, and in some cases truly immoral, does that then make the officers of today's police force immoral for even existing in the job itself? I don't think it does. Further, I think the notion that any one person occupying a slot in law enforcement carries with them a sense of ethical impurity because of historical wrongs is silly, to say the least. Laws built to wage this war are still on the books across the country, explicitly written to disproportionately target African American and Hispanic communities. What laws specifically state they can only be applied to African American and Hispanic communities? I'd love to know because I have yet to see that in practice anywhere. Again, if you mean to say that African American and Hispanic communities see a disproportionately high usage of drugs, then I tend to agree as would the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration as shown in the self-reported survey of Americans by race in illicit drug usage. But then that begs the question, why do those groups disproportionately use illicit drugs? Is it the police or legislators that are forcing these groups to take these drugs? Or is it something else, perhaps the fact that some parts of the current culture idolizes crime as some form of higher ideal to aspire to? Personally, I'd say the latter. No one is forcing anyone to take or possess drugs, or commit crime in general. Now, I agree the current punishments for petty drug offenses can be obscene, but again, are they obscene as a form of misguided general deterrence, or is it all to just oppress minorities? Gunmetal goes on to talk about how there was an uptick in police brutality due to an influx of white nationalists being inserted into police forces, which he cites from an FBI paper done in 2006. Police brutality was reinforced by a massive influx of white nationalist enrollment, as documented in an FBI memo in 2006. Not really a current resource, in which the paper states outright, there is little corroborated reporting on current strategic attempts by white supremacist groups to infiltrate law enforcement communities. And it provides exactly two instances in 2006 where there was an explicit attempt to do so, both of which were caught. To put that in perspective, there are over 800,000 police officers in the United States. With those two verified attempts, that makes it possible in 2006 that 0.00025% of the nation's officers were loosely tied to white supremacy. Yeah, it's just not a great point to make. Now, to be fair, the number I want is absolutely 0%, but no hiring standard is perfect, no vetting process is impenetrable, and no human is infallible, so there is a chance there are and will be people in our ranks that are not in it for the right reasons. He then goes on to speak about police unions and lobbies, which I am forgetting rid of, we're not above the law and should not act as such. He goes on to say, This is policing. 
Even the best of the best, working as hard as they can with their lives at stake to protect the public, cannot repudiate these realities while working as a part of the system. I vehemently disagree, and once again, these generalizations are not becoming of someone who can obviously think so deeply on topics as complicated as this. Just because Chicago PD has a union willing to get the blue flu, doesn't mean that my PD is then complicit with their acts by dint of being a police department. The math just isn't mathing. There are police departments out there that would comply with a gun take back program, and to say that mine would as well just because it too is a police department would be a complete mischaracterization. And you act as if repudiation is impossible, as if all the departments have a central head we report to. We don't. This all or nothing fallacy is inane and mind numbing. If one police department does something bad, then all of them are bad. Is not a very nuanced take in the slightest. In my daily life as a patrol officer, I strive for the protection of people's civil liberties, the sanctity of human life, and the caretaking for the community I deeply cherish. Ready or Not demonstrates those ideals, the ones we as all police officers should want to strive for. The police force that serves and protects, the one that cares for the innocent and conducts courageous acts. Ready or Not does not explicitly say, hey, these are the good guys, and here's why. You're simply tasked with trying to bring order to chaos. There is not a driving narrative that you and your team are outright good, nor does the game send any message pertaining to how impervious to mistakes police are. In fact, the opposite exists, as you are able to injure civilians and make mistakes, and the game penalizes you accordingly. So no, Ready or Not is not propaganda, nor is it just a fantasy. It's not about misleading the player about who these officers are, nor promoting some larger political ideal. It's about people taking up the mantle to do what no one else would want to do to take the job people least envy and the people who answer a higher calling on a daily basis. After all, at the end of the day, that's all we are as officers, just people. And as always, remember our sole objectives. Stop the killing. Stop the dying. I'll see y'all later.